Uh, I'm the Dickie Self, uh, director of the Center for the Study and Teaching of Writing. We have a research initiative that um, that funds pro projects that um, do uh, research into writing in 21st century context. This is certainly one of them, and uh, so they'll they'll tell you all about their their. Um, uh, their work and the many people working with them on this. All we did was we provided a small grant that would allow uh, them to. I'm not sure what you did with the grant. You can tell us that in a while. But you know, but it helped them get the whole thing rolling. And so that that's our part in it. And all we're doing is just recording their good work and, and claiming it as our own. So thank you. <laughs> not really. <laughs> Hello, Thank you. I'm, uh, I'm Joe Wheaton, I'm the Associate Director for the School of PAS, and it is uh, a great pleasure of mine to introduce my, some of my outstanding faculty when I get a chance to do so. And so, um, we have before us uh, two of that faculty, of our special education faculty, and uh, I'm sure that what they tell you today about spellography uh, will uh, be very important and very useful to you. Um, special education in this school is a very applied program and the work they do is always uh, cutting edge and it's always trying to uh, move forward with uh, evidence-based practices. So um, I'm very, very pleased and very proud to have these two me uh, members of my faculty uh, working for my school. So with that, I'd really like to thank you for doing this and. It's been a pleasure. Go for it. Thank you, Joe. I'm Terry Hessler. I'm an assistant professor in special education. I actually am assigned at the Newark campus, but I do a lot of my research here in collaboration with Moira. My colleague, Moira Conrad, is an associate professor. It's not on the screen as associate because it not just official. It just passed <laughs> through the provost. Provost? So humble Moira didn't want to put it on the screen, but I thought I'd mention that. Thanks. We are, um, we are both former classroom teachers and both former language arts teachers. And we have seen the negative impact that spelling problems can have on students, um, in, especially in their written expression. When I was a classroom teacher, before I was a special ed teacher, nobody ever told me how to teach spelling. I never had that in teacher prep, and um, this was way before the internet. So I didn't have a really easy go-to source for figuring out how to teach spelling. And I typically would do word lists. On Monday, I'd pass out the word list, and we might have activities on it during the week, but traditionally, they'd just go home and study, and then we'd have a test on Friday, and there was no analysis done, and Monday, there'd be a new word list. And, um, and I did it that way because that's how people told me to do it when I asked for help. And so I assume that that's what a lot of people do, and that's what we consider traditional spelling instruction in the schools today. Not much systematic um, instruction of rules and spelling patterns and, and that kind of thing. Um, and, and so we typically do written expression research. And yet we know that spelling is an important component of written expression. But this is a little bit outside of our comfort zone of written expression. We're, we're very com comfortable, with, I shouldn't even say very, written expression is a very complicated topic to research but we're more comfortable in that arena. So we went outside our zone a little for this, and we're grateful for the funding from CSTW to do that, as it also helped us involve some doctoral students in our school as well. Um, a little anecdote about the long-term impact. About six months ago, I served jury duty at, in Franklin County, and I was sitting in the jury, do, jury room one day waiting for a call to serve on the actually on the jury and you just sit, it's a lot of sitting around if you've served jury duty you know that somebody had left a newspaper out and i certainly had plenty to do but i noticed that the newspaper was open to the crossword puzzle and i love crossword puzzles so i thought i'd just take 10 or 15 minutes and do the crossword puzzle so i pulled the crossword puzzle but noticed that whosoever newspaper it was they had already started it but every word they had filled in was misspelled and i thought how sad you if you don't have strong spelling skills you cannot enjoy this wonderful relaxing, intellectually challenging, interesting activity, so simple as a crossword puzzle. And so even for adults, this has a negative impact, even if just for the quality of life. So that happened in the midst of our study, and it just kind of reiterated to me that this really is an important topic to study. And so we're grateful again that we had the opportunity to study that support from CSTW. 
CSTW. Spelling deficits may result from, I don't want to turn back to the screen either. The spelling deficits we figure may result from either a lack of explicit instruction in the rules of spelling. Think of my traditional spelling instruction when I was a classroom teacher. No instruction on why these words are spelled these ways, just here's the words, learn them, test them. A lack of phonemic awareness or phonemic awareness training, or a lack of, or a problem in phonological processing. I'm going to talk a little bit about phonemic awareness. Um, phonemic awareness is um, one major component of the spelling intervention that we implemented. So I want to actually do a couple <coughs> activities with you. Oh, what happened? <laughs> this is a good time because you don't need that to do these activities. So basically, phonemic awareness is really about the sound. It's about um, having students be able to manipulate the sounds in words. Um, when we do these exercises, I imagine that as adults who have awareness of print, who have letter sound correspondence, as we do these activities, you're going to be picturing in your mind some letters. I want you to not do that. I want you to try to push the letters aside and just focus on the sounds because I want you to think about what kids are doing. What kids are doing when they have made that connection between letters and sounds and we ask them to do these exercises they do it with nothing in front of them and they do it with limited um, access to the, the correspondence between letter and sound so i want you to just think sounds we'll start with a very simple one and i'm going to give you a signal it's going to be a snap when i snap i want you to respond so you guys will be my kids okay all right the word is run. What's the word? Run. run. Good. So here's the first thing, is just being able to repeat back a sound. And we, we actually noticed that it's some of the kids who we included in our study couldn't even, you'd say a word, just ask them to repeat it back, and they had a hard time even repeating back a word. So imagine now taking that word and trying to spell it when you can't even say it. You're not even hearing it correctly. And it's not because of a hearing deficit, but maybe because of a, a phonological processing deficit. <laughs> So you guys all passed the first step. We were able to repeat back the word. So let's do that again. The word is run. What's the word? Run. Excellent. Run has three sounds. How many sounds in run? Three. Go ahead and give me my signal, but you guys did it. What I'm going to do now is ask you to tap out the sounds in run. And by tap out, we could, we could do it two ways. We could do what I just did, run. Or we could actually physically tap our fingers, run. And some teachers even tap on the table, run. Okay, so let's tap out the sounds for run. Ready? Run. Excellent. So that's the first one is really just being able to segment sounds, to segment the sounds out of a word, okay? And um, they get increasingly difficult. I'll pass this around. This is actually the script that we wrote for um, some of these um, spillography activities. We're going to go to a little bit harder task since you guys are so advanced. This is sound substitution. So in this section, I'm going to read right from the script so you get a sense of how the teachers who implemented this in our um, study, how they actually had scripts in front of them when we're reading this. In this section, you will say a word and then change one of the sounds to say a new word. I'll do the first one as an example. The word is clam. I will change the k to s and say the new word, slam. Okay, see so that's a little harder, right? And imagine, I imagine that you guys were picturing letters. So you spelled out in your head the word clam, and then you replace the C with the S instead of replacing the K with the S, right? Which is what we want kids to be doing because that's part of that phonemic awareness. So now it's your turn. The word is spill. What's the word? Spill. Good. Change the P to T and say the word. Spill. Good. Okay, so again, you guys are probably picturing some of those letters. But you can see how that can be really challenging for kids who don't have letters. Um, and it's a really, really important component of reading and spelling instruction, this phonemic awareness piece. It is actually one of the best predictors of later reading and, and spelling. So it's um, something we really emphasized in the program. And we actually built into the program um, beyond what, um, what the program prescribes um, some mastery criteria within the lesson. So the kids actually had to get to a certain place in phonemic awareness before they could sort of test out of that section. So I'm going to pass it back over to Terry. Okay, as I mentioned before, poor quality or poor spelling can negatively affect the quality of written expression and as I discovered in jury duty, potentially quality of life. We know that children who struggle with spelling may also have difficulty <coughs> reading 
And there's an established acceptance that there's a need to identify effective spelling intervention, especially for our kids with disabilities. The tradition, spelling instruction traditionally is, as I described it, as how I did it as a classroom teacher, those, those word lists. We know that that's not effective for students with disabilities. That's how I learned spelling, as far as I can remember, in eons ago. And I would, that was effective for me. I didn't have a disability, most kids don't. So that might be quite effective for students without disabilities. For students with disabilities, it's not working. But we have found that instruction that is rule-based that teaches the letter sign correspondence that more we talked about a little bit, that teaches the phonemic awareness, that teaches the spelling patterns, why words are spelled the way they are, not why, but that certain words are spelled a, a certain way, does appear, to be, does appear to be effective for improving spelling and consequently some written expression outcomes. We found one rule-based um, program called Spelography, and it's designed around principles of effective instruction and we, we find that it's promising, but it lacks empirical validation. There are some studies we haven't found a whole lot. So um, we wanted to use this as the foundation for our study and, and to see if we could modify it in a way to use it with students with disabilities. The, the program teaches spelling rules explicitly and systematically, and it includes exercise each lesson has Ten exercises? Sometimes they vary, but several exercises within that are included with the purpose to improve spelling, improve phonemic awareness, uh, teach decoding skills, increase and improve reading fluency. Um, they have some written expression, written expression practice, and then there's vocabulary activities in each lesson as well. It includes the student workbook, and actually we worked with the blue one, and, and a teacher guide as well. According to the authors, the program targets certain kids. So the program is intended for intermediate to upper grade students. So it's a challenging program. It's for struggling spellers. It's for students who are reading at a mid third grade level, students who read better than they spell. And if it's gonna be used with students with severe disabilities, the authors recommend that it be used with students who had years of systematic language instruction or structured language instruction. An example of a structured language program is Orton Gillingham. If you know anything about language instruction, you might be familiar with that one. So we wanted to use it with kids with what we call high incidence disabilities, the milder disabilities. And um, these kids wouldn't have had years. We're, we particularly are working with some fourth graders, and so they wouldn't have had years of structured um, experience with a language program. So we, we modified the program. And we felt the modifications that we made would, uh, um, the modifications sort of made it okay to work with the population that we ended up working with. So some of the things that we added were a screening tool. So the, the child who had that phonological processing deficit who couldn't say back the word, that they would be screened out because that's a prerequisite skill for potential success in the program. We, add, we scripted the lessons. We provided that mastery criteria so that students could test out of a lesson after they reached the mastery criterion. We included a self-correction process called Copy, Cover, Compare. We'll talk about that a little bit later. And these prog this program was intended for use in a whole group setting. Um, and we um, implemented it in a one-on-one -on -one teaching arrangement. So those were some modifications we made for the children in the study. We also did a study with adults. And for the adults, we included a self-directed study component, so essentially, where with the children, the study with the children, it was all teacher directed. There were, it was predominantly self-directed with the adults in the study that we did. And then they have a copy cover compare strategy as well, but that was paired with an explicit rule instruction strategy where the instructor, the researcher actually read the rule, the adult read it back and wrote it, and then they did the copy cover compare. So the purpose of this study that we conducted was to examine the effects of our modified Spelography instructional program on spelling skids, skills with both children and adults. So in phase one, to answer Dickie's question, what, what we did in the first year and spent most of our money on was scripting lessons and producing binders that had the, the, the modified program in it. Which we don't have right now because our, our study is still going on and so there may be some some teaching of this program going on as we speak. But there's binders. Big, big binders. <laughs> so we spent money on binders, dividers, papers, and copying. 
graduate students. Grad students. And grad students. <laughs> we had one grad student during the first year that we um, compensated for work on it. The graduate students assisted with the work in this, in the, with the scripting. And then we piloted those scripts in a small pilot study that first year with two students. Here's a look at the sample script that we, or here's a sample script of the scripting that we did. So we took, for instance, lesson four from the, the workbook and we scripted it so that um, it would reduce, well, why don't you talk about the purpose of scripting? Well, part of the reason we do scripting is to take out some of the extra te teacher language that can be confusing to kids with disabilities. So our kids who have learning disabilities, almost all of them, I mean, by definition, it's a language problem. So what we do is we try to take out some of the extra fluff that teachers tend to add in. They want to go on and sort of elaborate on different pieces. And we have found that for a lot of our kids with learning disabilities, that um, extraneous language can actually be confusing. So we try to um, sort of keep it to a minimum, the, the extra teacher talk. Um, and we also do it for research purposes to help us with treatment integrity. We want to know that teacher interventionist A is implementing this intervention in the same way that interventionist B is. And we had four, maybe five, um, teachers implementing um, this program. So we wanted to know that they were implementing it in a similar way. And that's another, uh, another advantage of scripting. Okay. So, what you see up here is the T for the teacher language. So the T is what the teacher says during the lesson. And then the S is what the student should say. And included are, are the prompts that the teacher has to say to get the student to respond. And I don't think it's, oh, and it is right here. That there's also um, prompts that the teacher doesn't have to say right. That it's not scripted to the degree that they have to use that exact wording. But the indication is there should be positive feedback to the student when they give the right answer. There's also a procedure for immediate error correction that the interventionists learn to. And so the script doesn't say every time, if the student says the wrong answer, do this. But that's a procedure that we teach them so that that is a standardized error correction procedure. So the results of our pilot study, our first student we determined the modified spallography program was effective for that student. For student two, gains were made, but not to the mastery degree, especially that the first student made. And that was the data that indicated to us that perhaps the students need to have some prerequisite skills before we implement the program to maximize the effectiveness of the program. So for instance, student two had some phonological, um, well, I don't know if it was phonological processing skills, but the, the spelling skill that this particular student was missing was the ability to identify a medial vowel. So the, the, the researcher would say spell can, and the student would spell C-N. And that was consistent across short, sound, medial vowel. And I just want to clarify, we did screen kids, even in the pilot. We, we did talk to their classroom teacher and said, we want some kids who have some basics, who are able to do some basic spelling, but are struggling with some of the more advanced um, patterns. We also, um, there is a placement test within the program, so we used part of that as a screening tool. So the students did have to have some basic um, spelling skills, and this particular student was able to do okay on the placement test, and then for some reason during the intervention, it, we, what we figured out was that placement test wasn't quite sensitive enough to catching some of these things. So. Um, so he was able to spell, even on the placement test, some of the words were even harder than something like can. But he was able to spell that, and then when we actually got into the instruction, we saw, hmm, there weren't, it wasn't as consistent um, as we hoped it would be. So um, he probably wasn't as responsive to the instruction because he wasn't quite ready for that instruction. Okay, phase two was when we implemented the program with the, modif the some of the new modifications. Um, so we're, Again, we are still implementing systematic replications of that pilot study. We have two studies going on, one with fourth graders and one with adults. Four doctoral students and one undergrad are assisting in this phase two. Um, we wanted to share that we're working with an undergrad because that's a big mission here at OSU now is to involve undergraduate. Um, but we're not sharing any of her data yet. She's in a very early stage. She's an in-service, no, she's a pre-service teacher doing student teaching, right? So her, and hers is going to be more like a case study, and so she's finding that she can only conduct sessions once or twice a week, so her data isn't fully developed enough yet to share, but we wanted to share that we're involving an undergrad. And the four doctoral students are, um, we're in one school district? Oh, we'll talk yes. about participants and settings in a moment. Okay, thanks on condition. 
So before we could actually start collecting baseline data, we had to figure out what people knew and um, what they didn't. So what we did was we um, used that placement test, um, which is basically a sampling of, of words from each lesson. Um, and we used it for the first few lessons because we figured these kids, because they were identified as struggling spellers, they were identified as needing supplemental support, um, that they probably were going to be in the first book in the program and probably in the early lessons in the program. So we didn't feel like we needed to pretest all the words. We needed we, we wanted wanted to start where kind of where we thought they would be, and we were right. They placed right basically right at the beginning of the program. Um, so from there, what we did was we um, we took the words from, from each of the lessons. Each lesson targets 24 words, and we generated um, some word lists. Basically the same words, um, 10, divided into 10 word lists that were sort of a random selection or a random sampling of the 24 words. So what we did was we, um, we ran those, we created what we called probes, and each day that we met with the kids, we tested them on those 10 words. And so, um, that became sort of what we, what we did during baseline. So we just said, here's 10 words, here's 10 words, here's 10 words. Um, we didn't give them any instruction on those words. We didn't give them feedback on those words. We just wanted to know what they would do and what the, where they, their present level of performance was without any intervention. And we continued with that until they were studied. And you'll see when we look at the graphs. And, and those words were dictated and they were spelling yeah. pencil and paper. Right. Um, so after baseline, um, after we had some nice stable data, we moved into spillography instruction. And we targeted lessons two through five, which are the first um, instructional lessons within the program, um, focusing on consonant blends, the sounds, um, uh, spelling patterns that say that spell k, and uh, hard and soft g. Um, we did those 10 word probes. And once students moved into intervention, we didn't probe everything. We just probed the target words for that particular um, lesson. For students who went through the entire lesson and still weren't able to meet what we had determined as mastery criteria, um, we added a copy cover compare strategy. For some kid kids, they really needed some extra rehearsal on the words um, in spelling words, which sort of um, is a little bit different from what we expected. We sort of planned for that, so we wrote it into our IRB proposal because we know that some kids might need more practice. Um, but we were hoping that this philography would be enough for the kids to be able, because there's a lot of practice within, within the lessons, um, but we wanted to have this sort of extra backup reserve intervention to teach those words. We wouldn't want to spend a couple of weeks focusing on one spelling pattern. At the end of those few weeks, the kids still don't have it. Um, so we wanted to make sure that they, we added an extra piece. So basically what the do, kids do then is they copy the word, they cover it up, write it from memory, check their work, it's a self-correction procedure, and then rewrite the word. Um, we included fourth graders um, with learning dis uh, disabilities who received supplemental services. There were five girls included, uh, I mean four girls and one boy, which is very atypical for our special ed population. It tends to be um, overrepresented by boys, and especially in the learning, well, particularly, in, well, in any category, um, boys tend to be overrepresented. So we were surprised that this was sort of the group that got recommended for our, um, our um, study. And that was actually true for um, our adults, too, that they were women and not um, men. We implemented the study in an urban elementary school in the computer lab within that school. And again, it was a one-on-one -on -one teaching arrangement. Um, the other thing I want to say about, um, about the difference between the pilot and the um, intervention we during the pilot study, we were actually sort of switching interventionists, so the kid might not be working with the same teacher every time. So, and that was another reason for scripting it. We wanted to make sure that we could mark where we left off and the next teacher could pick up. And we found that logistically, from a research perspective, was very challenging to figure out all the pieces that contributed to, to the results that we got. But also from a, a connection with the kid kind of um, perspective too, that we wanted to make sure that the results weren't um, adversely affected by not being able to have a, a connection with the interventionist. So we, that's another thing we did in the second study um, was to actually be consistent. So every kid was assigned one tutor interventionist and that was there, that was how it um, remained throughout the whole study. Okay, we utilized single subject methodology in our study 
And um, if you don't know anything about single subject methodology, we're going to do a little six minute mini study on it, mini presentation on it. Many people hear the term single subject methodology and they, and they misunderstand that what we did was only use one subject. And really single subject methodology refers to the fact that we can use many subjects, we can use an infinite number and get really complicated with data collection, but you can use as many subjects as you want, but each subject acts as its or his or her own control. So the control is within the student, and that will be explained a little bit when Moira explains the baseline logic. But essentially, uh, we don't use a control group. The student acts as his or her own control. The reason we like single subject methodology, there's lots of reasons we like it. One is we work with the special ed population, and so we're already at a reduced potential population. So our N would be small unless we went to a lot of different schools to get a lot of subjects, and then that complicates our our procedural implementation of a study. So one is our population is already small to begin with, so group study becomes a little bit um, impractical. In addition, when you do a group study, say a pre-post, and a statistical analysis is applied, I don't know a lot about statistical methodology, so if I flub this, please forgive. But essentially, you are, you are not looking at individual performance, you're kind of applying the statistical analysis to even out the playing field and get a general, not average result, but something like that. And in our field, we're not interested in that result. We're interested in the result of those kids who are lower performing. And so we don't want to cover up those differences. We want to look at those differences. So group study doesn't work well for us. And um, the third reason I'm drawing a blank on, darn it, has to do with Oh, being responsive to the intervention. So in single subject methodology, she mentioned that we included the copy cover compare in the IRB. We've learned with the IRB process to throw in these, okay, if this intervention doesn't work, we're gonna try this. Because otherwise, if you don't throw that in, then your study, and if you don't, you're not getting good results, then oh my gosh, you have to stop and start all over again. Well, that works really well with us because we like to, we look at the data, what we call real time. So as those students were doing those probes, the researchers were bringing us the data and we were seeing how they were doing relatively quickly after they did it so we could see if the intervention was working. And with single subject methodology, we, we look at those pictures, those graphs, and see how they're doing in real time so that if it's not working, they don't have to keep practicing and practicing and practicing with an ineffective intervention. We can try something different. Hence, I mean, in this case, we didn't do something different, we added a piece. So single subject methodology actually works really well for us in special education, both research and in practitioner, in, pra in practice, because we can just try to keep trying something new without having to wait until the end of an intervention to discover, bummer, nothing worked. Okay. So what we do is we apply something called baseline logic. And basically what that means is that we look at from, let's talk about it from a practitioner standpoint first. As a practitioner, you want to figure out where your kids are. So that's your baseline. You figure out where your kids are performing. Then you say, hey, maybe they're not performing the way that I want them to be performing in an academic skill, a social skill, whatever the arena. You implement some kind of instruction or intervention. Hopefully it works. And by it working means that the student's behavior or skills changes in the direction you want them to change in. So, they improve. From a practitioner, what we, from a practitioner standpoint, what we can do is assume that because of, as I was collecting baseline data, it was low or high, whatever, the opposite of, um, if it's the opposite of where you want it to be, right? So then we do an, an intervention and it changes. I make this assumption that my intervention worked. And that's, as a practitioner, that's good. That's what we want to do. There's no point in questioning it or ch challenging it. We just Say, hey, what I'm doing is working, I'm gonna keep doing it. From a researcher standpoint, that's a good start. It's not good enough to say I have experimental control. I know with certainty that what I did worked. So what we have to do is take baseline logic a step further and apply the principles of prediction, verification, and replication. So we're gonna give you a little mini lesson on single subject research so that when we show you our graphs, you'll be able to um, analyze them like a pro. So these are actually not our graphs from this study. This is previous, a previous study. Um, what we do is we collect baseline data. And you'll see those three data points for each of these tiers. This is called a multiple baseline because we have three different baselines. 
and it's staggered, so kids start intervention at different times. And the reason we stagger it is because we want to know if I just started everybody at intervention at the same time, it doesn't control for those things like maturation, oh, or some other kind of thing that may be going on in the school. Oh, everybody got a new intervention, so everybody goes up. So we stagger it in time so that when there is a change, we can say it really was what I did and not something else. And so we, that's our way of controlling for threats to internal validity. So we have baseline data, right? So then what we do is, and I talked about that, um, prediction, verification, and replication. So the first thing we do is we predict. We make two predictions. The first prediction is, what would happen if I didn't intervene? So what you want to know is, are those baseline data stable enough that if I weren't going to do anything, I could make a guess at where the next baseline data point would be? So let's look at that first tier. Let's pretend we didn't do an intervention. Where might you predict that first data point, the next data point to be? Anyone? Where might it be? What? Any? But let's, so I'm looking at, we have a two. Use your, use your. Oh, sorry, yeah. So here we go. Somewhere between two and four. And actually, it's a little bit confusing because there's three kids here. But let's say for, um, let's say for Ben, that's a square, a square, a square. Let's say, let's predict that it might be around there. So if, you, if your baseline data are stable, you should feel confident that you could make some kind of guess about where it might be. So that's the first step, is to predict where it would be if it wouldn't. Now the only way we're gonna verify that is if we don't intervene. Well, we have to intervene, that's the whole purpose. So that's why we stagger our baseline. So now for me, my next two tiers, I can verify that prediction by not intervening. Did those stay nice and low and flat? Okay, I just verified that first prediction. The second prediction that I want to make is what would happen if I do intervene? And in, in group research, we might call this a hypothesis. Okay, we call it a prediction. I'm going to predict that if I intervene, something's going to happen. Now, if I have a nice, robust intervention that's going to make an immediate impact, then I would predict that once I bring in my intervention, that there's going to be a change in the desired direction. Okay? So I would predict that. Now, the way that I verify that prediction is obviously by doing interventions. So that's easy. The first verification is easy. Then what we have to do is what's called replicating that. And so we verify that by bringing in intervention in the next two tiers. And we say, OK, there were changes made there too. Not quite as robust in this last tier, but changes nonetheless. The other way to think about that is, was there an effect? And as a classroom teacher, that first tier would be enough. I would say. My kids were low, I intervened, I'm done. As a researcher, I have to replicate that effect to be absolutely certain that it was what we did and not something else. So I replicate the effect across these tiers at different times, okay? So now let's look at the real data from our study. And we're gonna present these kids um, in the order in which they've sort of completed the program. And by program, I mean the first four, le the first four lessons. We haven't actually done the whole program. Um, and nor will we have time because it's spring and <laughs> the year ends. The, that's what we love about applied research. We never get it finished. Um, so in many, um, in many um, research uh, methodologies, we might be looking at um, descriptions of data in narrative form, or we might be looking at descriptions of data in number form. In single subject research, we throw both of those out. We look at at pictures. We like to look at the pictures. We talk about it too. <laughs> so here's the picture of Bubble, our first student. Um, the students chose their own pseudonyms. Yes. <laughs> okay. we, we, we don't actually, we're not at, we decided to actually not put it the way she spelled it. <laughs> so this is, this is our corrected version of Bubble's name. So here is Bubbles. So you can see what we did different here is that the tiers don't represent different kids. The tiers represent the different lessons. So in lesson two, we intervene, and this is actually a stronger design than the one I just showed you, because the one I just showed you, so let's say John is in that first tier, I have John in baseline, then I have John in intervention. I don't get to do the verification and replication with John. So I can say across those kids that intervention worked, but I can't say it worked for John, because I didn't have all those pieces for John. Here I have all those pieces with bubbles. So not only can I say it works, I can say it worked with her. 
And that's another great advantage of using single subject research. When we, when we throw all the data into, a, into SPSS and run the, run the um, means, it washes out all those individual differences, um, which Terry talked about. Those, that's what we want to see. I want to know it worked for every single kid that I worked with, not the group as a whole. And we say we, are, we come from a behavioral background, so we talk about individuals behaving, not groups behaving. So we want to look at in how individuals behave. Um, and this would be an example of that. So in lesson two, um, you can see the data here. This is baseline data. In this case, it wasn't a very stable pattern, but if it's trending in the opposite direction that you want it to go in, that's fine too. Not fine from a classroom teacher's perspective. Obviously, you wouldn't want, that to, want to see that. But from a researcher's perspective, that's good enough to say, okay, this kid is going in the opposite direction we want him to be going, let's start intervention. And by the way, this is, these data represent the number of words spelled correctly on those end of the lesson 10 word probes. Right. right. Okay. So, uh, so what we do here is intervene. She starts spillography. You can see dramatic increase after one session. Okay, one session. Um, she's higher than her higher, highest baseline data point. Then two more sessions she meets our mastery criteria. Now, um, one of the limitations of our study, which we'll talk about later, um, is that we never tested the full package. We never tested the full spillography. And we recognize that as a limitation. We recognize that the authors of this program, that we did not implement it exactly as intended. But what we really wanted to look at is, is promise, is the promise of this intervention. Is it promising? Is it something that's worth taking to, a ne to the next level in terms of, of testing it um, with this population in this way. Um, so we didn't, she, Bubbles didn't even finish lesson two. She, she, and from special ed perspective, where we're talking about kids who are already behind, we have to think about instructional efficiency. Did she need to stay in the whole lesson? And I, I would think that the um, authors of this program might say yes. Um, and that may be true. That may, and. You know, that's an empirical question um, that yet is, is yet to be answered. But in our, in our case, we set some master criteria to say, let's, let's move her on to the next skill. If she, if she got two tens in a row, she got perfect scores on two days in a row, um, and we'll monitor her in maintenance to see how she does. And you can see, two weeks with no instruction, three weeks, five weeks, six weeks, nine weeks out, she was still spelling those words way better than this and at pretty high levels. So three sessions, she was able to get that set of words. Um, meanwhile, on to lesson three, what we did in baseline here is after we got, after we knew we were ready to start with lesson two, we stopped probing in these lessons because there's no, there were four, ten, four sets of 10 words. We're not gonna probe 40 words every day with the kids. 10 seemed like plenty. Um, so we stopped testing in, the, in this tiers where we weren't in, intervening. But right before we started intervention again, we wanted to, probe one more time just to make sure something else didn't happen. And you can see in lesson three, she remained sort of in that same range. So we, we said, okay, that's stable enough. Let's move her on. And um, a, she had similar kind of result here, a dramatic increase, steady responding, similar kinds of maintenance results with the exception of this data point. Sometimes we can take that data point and say, that was a bad day, that was the day she didn't have breakfast, that was the day she came in crying about something else that happened. We don't actually have a specific incident for that outlier, um, but it is something that we think about, and it's something that looking at individual data, an individual student's data, allows us to do, is to say, well, what's going on here? And had, had we um, had a similar issue here, where this was low, we might have said, okay, we need to do some booster sessions here. This wasn't an outlier, this was a drop off in maintenance. But looking at the data now, we can say that was not the case. So you can see here, um, um, lesson three was pretty similar to lesson two. With lesson four, she was already a little bit higher um, here, and then she had some increases. Let me point out that lesson three and lesson four both worked on the um, sound and how to spell k. So there may have been some overlap in terms of some generalization. So she may have had some improvements here in baseline that carried over from what she was learning. And as a teacher, that's exactly what we'd want to see, right? We'd want to see that our instruction in one area is having a positive effect in all kinds of other areas. And that may have been the case. And of course, there are, there are also all kinds of other things that are going, hopefully there's some kind of instruction going on in school as well. 
So, so we keep monitoring to see what happens. Um, if this had kept going up, 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 we would have said, hmm, that tier is kind of a wash. We can't really do, we can't really do um, research with that tier. We might have still done the intervention just to keep the lessons consistent. Um, but it dropped back off and stabilized again, so we were able to intervene and um, eventually got her up to higher levels. Um, down here, tier five, so or tier four, lesson five. Um, we have one kind of outlier here where she did pretty well. And we, again, these are randomly generated probes that sort of represent, so sometimes they were easier probes than others. And that's why, another reason why we wanted to do these repeated measures, because hopefully some of that would wash out. Um, so, oops. so we intervened here, an improvement here. Notice a little bit higher, um, this one baseline data point gives us some overlapping data, which we don't like to see. but. Um, but it's there anyway. So a little bit more of a gradual increase here, not quite as dramatic as, as these two tiers. Um, and that may explain this drop off here, that it was a harder um, set of skills for her to master. Um, and so she dropped back down to lower levels. Um, this would be, she might be a case for, okay, now we need to go back in and see if we can do some booster sessions with her. Okay, so that's Bubbles. Zell is our next student. Very similar kind of pattern with Zell. Notice he's not quite as far along as she is. She, he only has one um, maintenance data point, so we'll have to go back and check on him. But similar kinds of, of um, patterns here for him. Uh, Stable-ish baselines, a little bit more variability in some of them. Um, and then in, for both of those kids, they didn't need that supplemental cop copy cover compare. The spellography instruction was sufficient for getting them to levels where they, they could spell those words independently. Hannah um, is finished with intervention, but she has no maintenance data yet. We're not there with her. Okay. But similar kinds of. Also didn't need copper cover compare. Also did not need it. So you can see this direct, you know, the faster they get through the lesson, they get through this lesson fast, and all of a sudden they're done with lesson five. I mean, it's. For some of the kids, they were just we were just able to do that. And with one-on-one -on -one instruction, you can be responsive. There's a lot more opportunities for the for the kids to respond. They're getting a lot more feedback on their responses, and it's much more immediate. Um, obviously, that's not going to be ideal for every situation. Not every classroom teacher is going to be able to say, "Okay, time for one-on-one -on -one instruction." So that's another um, issue with you know something we want to think about in terms of future. Um, now we get to nine nine. A um, little bit slower at getting, getting it. So you can see, yes, she definitely made some improvements. And she met what, what our mastery criteria were, but she never really blew the top off of it. Okay? She maintained higher levels than at baseline. Same thing here. But it's taken her longer, um, which is why we're just now starting lesson four with her. And you can see that first. <laughs> That first session didn't quite do it for her. Um, just anecdotally, what our, um, our interventionists noted was that when kids sort of got that phonemic awareness click, not something we can operationalize, but when they all of a sudden started doing things like this independently, when they started, when they were actually able to do those exercises that we did at the beginning here with less prompting, that all of a sudden, so those kids who first couple of sessions were lower, there would be this sort of, aha, I get it. And then, then the, re the rest was sort of history from there. Um, and then we have Jam. Jam has needed supplemental instruction. Um, oop, you see for Jam here, there's definitely an increase. And it's a very nice trend from going from two correct or one correct to three, four, five. I mean, very nice and steady um, responding. But she never got to our mastery criteria. We implemented four sessions of copy, cover, compare, and still never got to mastery. Um, she got a lot closer, and she did maintain. And what we did was we did a few we did a few shorter term maintenance with her. And that's the other thing. You know, we can't. If we had done a group design, we wouldn't have been able to monitor her that closely. But we were able to say, well, let's monitor her, and if she stays at around eight ish, then we'll we'll say, okay, let's. Let's call that lesson done and keep moving on. Um, for um, let's see. 
Similar here, a nice change, but still not able to reach master. So these, these lines here represent a change of phase. So we, we're finished with, there's no more. We're done with the lesson. There's no more content to cover, and she still hasn't met it. Um, so she's doing CCC right now and working on getting up there with that particular um, set of words, okay? Um, Jam is someone who um, probably has some real phonological processing deficits. She is one of those students you ask her to say a word and she has a hard time actually repeating back the word. Um, so she's probably someone who would need more intensive intervention than what this program can offer. Um, so more like what Orton Gillingham based methods that Terry mentioned before. So you need a rest. <laughs> so for, our, for this study with the kids, our findings suggest that for most of them, the modified spellography instruction was effective. So we were, we were happy to see that their, skele their spelling skills improved. We also discovered that what a good thing we put in that copy cover compare because Jam needed it. And so it's good to have that um, supplemental in, uh, intervention ready to go. And, um, and again, Jam needed it, so we were glad to have it. We have social validity data. It's, uh, I'm sorry, for this study, the social validity data hasn't been collected yet, but we get, we're getting a lot of anecdotal observations from our researchers about them, about the students, and they're telling us that the students seem to really enjoy the program. Now, we're taking that with a grain of salt because these kids are being pulled out of other activities, but not, we're not pulling them out of literacy instruction, right? right. So um, we didn't want to penalize them in that way, but they get to go with a new person to the computer lab and, and so there's something to be said for that kind of one-on-one -on -one interaction. So we don't know yet if that's what they really like about it. I actually did get to observe one of the sessions for procedural fidel fidelity, uh, procedural integrity data purposes and the student, it seemed to be that the student was engaged in the process of the spillography instruction. So I don't think it was just that they were with um, an adult on their own. Um, and also for this, with the student study, um, we, do, we haven't um, analyzed the inner observer agreement data yet, but it's um, what we call um, permanent product, so it should be easy to check. We just need to make sure that, that what the researcher indicated was a correctly spelled word is a correctly spelled word. So this, this will be easy data to analyze, and we anticipate that it will be high, a uh, high percentage. Except for those kids who have really poor handwriting. Yes. <laughs> that is, is that an R or an S? <laughs> that is a difficulty in this kind of study. And then writing fluency data, which is a generalization measure, which when we originally set out to do the program was really high on our list of priorities because we are researchers in written expression. Um, we, don't, we haven't fully analyzed those kind of generalization measures yet either. So those are um, things still to do. Oh, and you do have a note there about what we do have right now doesn't appear to show robust results. So we're saddened by that. Limitations in future research. The maintenance outcomes on all those students were mixed. Some did, had really great maintenance, some were lower. Um, so in future re research, we're thinking that the possibility exists that that master, mastery criterion shouldn't be as low as uh, reaching eight out of 10 for three or nine out of 10 for two, maybe that it should be 10 out of 10 three times in a row or something like that, that should improve maintenance results. We don't have any measures of spelling generalized to contextual writing, and we wanna include those generalization measures, both proximal and distal, so short and longer uh, term in future studies. We didn't, again, we didn't study the entire program. We did lessons two through five. We skipped over one as it being maybe too elemental for these kids, so um, in the future we might wanna be able to start at the beginning of the school year and work all the way through all of the lessons and maybe even further in the books. And again, we have more girls than boys, which is unusual. So we want to have a more even gender distribution in future research. In study two, this is the one where we have one graduate student who wanted to, who has experience working with adults. And um, it was about the time that I found the crossword puzzle and was thinking, wow, how sad, you know, that this has impact longer term than just school. And so I thought it was a great idea that we tried this program out on adults. One of the things that Moira and I have noticed, and um, I think is one of the reasons that I definitely work with an older population, is in special ed there seems to be, I don't know if bias is the right term, but we tend to spend a lot of effort and energy on the younger kids, which is good and fine and I'm okay with that. 
but I feel I was a classroom teacher for middle school and high school and I feel like there's still a lot of learning to be done we shouldn't throw in the towel on these kids yet so I have a soft spot for the older population adolescents and older so again this was a great idea I think to show that even as adults if you have poor spelling skills let's show that it's possible you can improve your spelling skills so a great idea to move into um, working with adults so we skipped you know, middle school, yeah, high, school, school high school, straight to college. <laughs> well, the researcher in question is one of our doctoral students who teaches one of the uh, intro courses, and so she had access to university age population. So she asked for volunteers and got volunteers, and she conducted the studies in one of the buildings in the conference rooms in this building. And these were um, pre-service teachers who struggled with spelling, and so obviously there's um, there's a good reason <laughs> to do some intervention yeah. with this group of students for their own confidence and for their ability to present themselves professionally and for their ability to teach kids how to spell, <laughs> which is gonna probably fall under their <laughs> list of things to do. Yes, talk about more bang for your buck, let's pass it on. <laughs> okay, so pre-baseline was very similar. There was a pre-test constructed from the words. She used um, lessons that were further along in the book yeah, to book create. C. So further along the, the program. program. And um, drawing a blank on baseline. So same thing with the 10 word random probes initially in baseline and no instruction or feedback given at that time. And again, we want to see stable responding or a descending trend in a way that we don't want it to go. The intervention was just a little bit different. So we had the spillography instruction that was modified um, the lessons were selected by, so depending on how the two women did on their pretest was how she determined where they would start in the lessons. And then um, if they didn't do well on those 10 root probes, if they didn't meet mastery, there was the rule-based instruction condition where she said the rule that the spelling patterns were based on, the, uh, the students repeated it back and then they wrote it out and then they did the copy cover compare. So, uh, a relatively efficient method of rule-based instruction. So she started her, she took the lessons and divided them into three, did I say that right, sessions? Yes. Okay. <laughs> she started with that phonemic awareness drill that Moira showed you. Then they independently completed workbook activities. That she had, and I, I wish I had a copy of her version, but she had color-coded the activities in here with some sort of written-in stop, stopping points. So it would say, like, stop here for check. So then she was there. She was, it wasn't like they took the workbooks home. Um, she worked with them in the class in that conference room. And so there were directions to say stop and get feedback, and they would go through the exercises and correct it. But they did much more of it on their own as opposed to scripting out every word, you know, that teacher um, student kind of exchange. More realistic for the adult population. Um, then she did the 10 word probe at the end of the session and if they, whatever they didn't meet master mastery criteria on it, no, they did on all of the words for her study. For her study, they did the copy no, cover. Just the ones they misspelled? Yes. Okay. So on the ones that they misspelled, they did the copy cover compare strategy. Here are the results for Nicole, who was the one with the learning disability, right? No, we did the other one first. Uh, wait. Yeah, right. Okay, so Nicole started on lesson 22. See, they have pseudonyms here, so we're not trying yeah, to remember who's who. <laughs> we had their real names, then we remember who was who. So you should be familiar now a little bit with the tiered baseline, and here's the baseline data. And she did relatively well the first time, but on the next two probes dropped to 50%, so intervention could be implemented. And we did, and she started with the spillography instruction and didn't meet the mastery criterion, which for the adults we held higher for them. And so she didn't meet the mastery criterion, and again, she divided each lesson into three sessions, so that was three sessions, didn't meet the, mis the mastery criterion, so had to implement the rule-based instruction, and then met mastery criterion. So her maintenance data are relatively high. So the yes. dotted line is the rule-based? Yes, that's where the rule-based changed. Yeah, and in hindsight, particularly for this, um, we probably should have just probed and not moved into the rule instruction there because she didn't even have an opportunity to show yeah. mastery yeah. If, we, if we set it at two tens. Um, but it was sort of one of those things where we finished, move on to the next thing, and we didn't think, oh, wait, we shouldn't have moved on. We should have just given her a chance to get that second probe because if she had done that and met mastery, she might have done it without. Yeah. So we, weren't, we, we were um, a little bit negligent in terms of being able to tease out that rule-based 
the, the contribution of the rule-based instruction for this particular And interesting, issue. again, negligent on the research side certainly didn't hurt her to get the rule-based instruction. Right. So, <laughs> so yeah, we can't say for sure. So um, in lesson, boy, I can't even read that. Nine, yeah. Nine, okay. That's um, actually from the same book that the children used. She needed instruction, and both students needed, needed instruction in that lesson. Mid-level responding here. Um, and Itch and scratch. <laughs> TCH. Challenge. Went into when baseline indicated intervention was appropriate, went into the spillography instruction, didn't meet criteria again, so into rule based instruction and met criteria. And we've had a chance for two data points. Here, very stable responding. This is textbook stable responding. Yay, we like that in research. And after spillography instruction, a significant jump, again, same issue. She didn't have a chance to meet it, should have just given her another probe, but we went up right into rule-based. Haven't had a chance to probe past four weeks at this point. Rachel, um, similar baseline data in Lesson 22 to Nicole, come to think of it, but she dropped low enough and stable that intervention was appropriate, so we implemented the spillography instruction. Um, high responding rates, but not to criteria, so we went to rule-based instruction and two sessions and she's there at criteria. Maintenance data, relatively high. And then you can eyeball the, the rest. So notice in, in the last two tiers for her, maintenance data, not so good. Um, Rachel is a student who did self-identify as having a learning disability. She did receive services for a learning disability in elementary school. Um, so she may be one of those students who need something more intensive than this. Um, I also want to point out um, one of the things, and we'll talk about this more when we talk about limitations, um, that what happened with the rule-based instruction was even more explicit than the rule presented in here. And so it would have been interesting to sort of switch the order of those. Do the rule, have them repeat the rule, yeah. teach them the rule, and then see what that does all by itself. And then give them, sure, give them some extra practice with the words. Um, and it may, it may be interesting to sort of compare if you do rule first and then spillography. And, and not that this isn't rule, but that's sort of our, what we've termed it, which is explicitly say the rule, repeat it back, and so forth. Um, so it may be that they needed the, a little bit of practice with the words, then the rule to say, oh, I get it. But it may be that the other way around would have been more efficient. That's a, an empirical question. Future study. We did have. Um, Inter observer agreement on hers too, and this is an indication. This is where you know we checked were the spelling words really correctly spelled. And again, it's high, it's pro permanent product. We expected no less from that, and especially from adults who probably have decent handwriting. The um, for some of the student, well, for some, for one of the students, the limited exposure of the spelling rules in the program didn't seem to be sufficient, so we had to do the rule based. And Moira's idea of switching them might might be the the solution to that problem, or it might be that the rule-based instruction was was the answer, um, as that as they met mastery after that occurred. And with Nicole, she not only self-identified, or Rachel not only self-identified as having a learning disability when she was in school, but she also indicated that she had tried other interventions to try to improve her spelling. So um, her whatever the deficit was resi was resistant to. To intervention, in, as indicated by her self-identification with others, so um, something may be necessary in order to improve that long-term maintenance yeah. for her. So essentially, this was an intervention package. This study too, with that, with the copy cover compare plus rule-based intervention. So to tease out those components might be useful for a future study. Can't say for sure which part of the component, or if it was indeed because it was packaged together, that it was useful for them. So we might do a component analysis in the future. Um, student work was monitored throughout the study, but for, um, for her study, the procedural integrity was not assessed. That's a pretty critical point in, in research that the, re that the intervention was implemented as instructed. We feel not that we feel we should be excused from that, but it's a scripted, I mean, in, in the second study case, not so much a scripted case, but it, it's, 
it was a three minute phonemic awareness drill and then independent study for 20 minutes. So how much procedural and you know, how badly could you screw up the intervention like that essentially. So we feel pretty confident that the procedural integrity was high, but that's probably, that's not probably, that's, that's poor research practice not to take procedural integrity. And then we didn't assess generalization either. So future research would indicate that we would do some sort of maybe writing assignment, asking her to include the words or Ideally, go to her other instructors and say, you know, can we look at her work and see if she's spelling these words correctly, kind of thing. Again, our purpose is really to look at the promise right. of this as a as a package. Um, and so, you know, now that we see that it's definitely got some promise, now we, we ratchet it up and say we're going to do all these things that we didn't do this time to make it make it better. So implications for practice with children, we. We want to point out that rule-based instruction is important for our struggling spellers. So to have some systematic rule-based instruction and not the random word lists like I did when I was a teacher is, is best. Don't get done with I know. Bad teacher you are. My confessor. <laughs> it was before I knew about this. Spelling doesn't just happen with exposure to words. Um, and spelling instruction should not be minimized. A, a lot of people um, think that it's just not important. And in fact, there was a study done in which the researchers determined that spelling, kids paying attention to the spelling was getting in the way of their producing the written product. So that's where the idea of invented spelling came from. They said, just spell it however you think you, you will, and then we'll, we'll go back and edit it later. And somehow that invented spelling got pulled out without the, and we'll go back later and <laughs> fix it, and teach you about it. And so invented spelling became this whole movement in education. And so. Um, as if it's just not important, don't worry about it. And, and I think anybody who's received an email or if you're on Facebook and you see the misspellings, you just, I mean, some of it is, you know, just keyboard error and quickness and that kind of stuff, but communication is impacted by incorrect spelling. So it shouldn't be minimi minimized. With the adults, we found a self-study program that included a rule-based component could be successful, a successful option for students who are adults who want to improve their own spelling. Um, I googled adult spelling program and the first page of uh, items that came back, there were 12 potential items, nine of them were adult, different adult spelling programs and I just clicked through a couple of them and I couldn't tell what the foundation of the program was. So an implication for adults going to the internet to look for spelling help needs to be they need to verify that it's a rule based instruction or it might not be helpful for them. So we are grateful we had the opportunity to kind of go outside our comfort zone of written expression um, research to do spelling and uh, we're grateful to that, grateful to Dickie that we had the opportunity to do it with CSTW's brand.